Welcome, you're watching David the Real Medvite, and this video is going to be about is Christianity a Jewish religion? What I mean by that it could be multiple different things. Some people consider Ju Christianity as a as a as an offshoot of Judaism, as a rebellion against Judaism. I heard those interpretations as kind of this um, different version of Judaism, and multiple different understandings as well. And I want to kind of that kind of I want to respond and clear out any um, misunderstandings about this topic myself as, as an Orthodox Christian and this question most of the time is asked by it comes up in people's minds 95% of those people tend not to have good knowledge on Christianity they tend to have a very poor understanding of it they don't really have any good idea of it and so it's very easy for them to fall into this trap. The other 5% are bad-willed Christian Zionists who aren't even Christians. So I have two videos that I would like to recommend before I even start. I have two videos that I would like to recommend that deal with adjacent topics. One of them is a refutation of Christian, so-called Christian Zionism. And the other is against the alt-right neo-pagans, basically atheists who pretend to be religious. And it is titled, Is Christianity a quote, quote, cucked, unquote, religion? Both of these videos will be in the description. They will be on the top right or left bar or whatever. So I have made two videos on adjacent topics. But this is something different. I'm going to talk about its relationship with Judaism. How should we consider Judaism? What is it? What, what is the deal with all of this kind of stuff? We're going to be looking at all of that. And I think we're most likely going to be dealing with other topics as well while we're dealing with, with this. So I want to begin with this video presentation, whatever. And one of the, well, there's multiple different, I suppose, ideas that people have in their mind when they say this. So some of them say, well, you know, you have the Old Testament and that is the Hebrew scriptures and you consider them as divine scriptures too. So there's a, there's a relationship with Judaism, right? Some of them say, well, the new, even the New Testament has this kind of Jewish vibe in it. I mean, the apostles are Jewish. Most of the people are in there are Jewish. What's going on there, right? And this video, is, I'm mostly going to be looking at biblical verses, not, not commentaries, but just kind of just Bible verses. I want to support my argument with Bible verses. Um... And as I said, since most of the people that say these things don't have much good knowledge on the scriptures, ultimately the best antidote is to read the scriptures, right? Uh, but read them with the right mind, not with not becoming your own pope, but rather reading it with the correct Orthodox phronema. And as as an Orthodox Christian, will basically tell you to become Orthodox naturally. But let's start. So. Uh, one of the things that people say at the beginning is, oh, look at, for example, Genesis 12, right? And, and in Genesis 12, 3, God says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all, the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is a typical uh, Christian Zionist talking point that I covered in the other video. But, I mean, Abraham is the father of Jews and uh, Christians claim to be a continuation of that. So, you know, that is one of those things. And then you look at even in the New Testament, right? Matthew 23, 2. Uh, it's showing here. The scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish people, sit in Moses' seat, meaning they are the legitimate people. And then we look at, let's look at then John 4. John four nineteen, for example. The woman at the well, well St. Fotini, said to Christ, I proceeded, you are a prophet. And then, he, and then she didn't, She's a schismatic, right? She's, she's a Samaritan. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So you look at these verses, and you start to, you start to get this kind of understanding more and more. That Christianity is this Jewish religion, this Jewish faith. It's, it's 
How else could it be? What else could it be? So I want to say straight right off the bat is that I will say that we as Christians, when we're speaking of the Old Covenant period, don't have any problem with these kinds of statements. Um, but what matters is what the point of the Old Covenant is. So I want to reframe this kind of discussion. Is that what's the point of the Old Covenant? And why is it the Gentiles are now part of the true faith? Is Judaism the true faith? Or is Christianity the true faith? That Those are the kind of questions that we need to ask ourselves. So I want to start by going at Luke 3.8. This is from St. John the Baptist. He's talking with the Jews that are coming to him. And he says to the, to the Jews, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. He's basically criticizing the Jews. He's saying really mean things to them, by the way. I didn't put them here, but you can read Luke for yourself and see that I'm right. But he says, Bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, right? So basically saying, don't trust your own ethnic lineage. Don't just say, we have Abraham as our father. Why? Because with God, all things are possible. God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now, in Jewish culture, these stones, stones represent Gentiles. So what St. John the Baptist is saying here is that God can raise up children of Abraham from Gentiles. Then let's look at John 8. This is Jesus debating with the Pharisees who definitely don't like him at all. Um, I believe. All right. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Which is very ironic because the, they are under Roman bondage the moment they say this, but they say we've never been in bondage to anyone. So it's kind of shows you this kind of like understanding that the Jews who were debating Jesus had at the time. Christ answered to them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So he accepts their premise, but basically says, you, you're still slaves to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. So he's asking, he's basically saying, you're doing the things of your father. And he's kind of implying that Abraham is not their father. And Christ, Jesus said to them, if you're Abraham's children, you will do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. So there's this kind of vibe, and we will get to this, that you're not the true Jews in the sense. What does that mean? Well, I'm not promoting this silly, um, oh, white people are the real Jews nonsense. I'm obviously not promoting that. That's, that's idiotic nonsense. No one with triple digit IQ will ever believe in that stuff. What I am saying is that being part of the true faith is about holding on to the true faith, holding on to the faith of Abraham who held on to the true faith. That's what really what being a Jew is about. It's not about it is there it is there is obviously an ethnic lineage called the Jewish lineage, obviously. From the line of Judah, right? But this is not what faith is, rather. Being, being part of the true faith does not, is not something of your ethnic lineage, it's about faith. And so the, the Jews said to him, We were not born of fornication, we have one father, that is God. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you will love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he is the one who sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. He's basically saying the devil is your father. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he's a liar and the father of it. I want to also add that it, before the crucifixion, there were two people that Jews 
had to choose to be released. One of them was Jesus and the other was Barabbas. Barabbas means son of the father. Barabbas now was a murderer. He was a piece of shit. And Barabbas, he was named son of the father. And his father is of the devil. So it's kind of also prophesying basically what's going to happen in the future. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Uh, which of you convinced me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Which is also ironic because Jesus Christ is not from uh, Samaria. Uh, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. And, you and like four chapters before this chapter, he, he was telling the Samaritan woman that salvation is of the Jews. But now he's debating the people that he says has the salvation, right? If we go back to Matthew 23, the, the, the verse I showed you, they sit on Moses' seat. The same chapter, he's very much critiquing the same Jews. He's basically, don't do the works of the Pharisees. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me, and I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you are. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. So now he is saying that your father Abraham saw my day. The Jews knew what he was saying because they said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? And so Christ is telling the Jews that Abraham has seen me. And this is what I'm getting at in this question. Is that if the God that Abraham saw was Christ, the word of God, the word of God who became incarnate and is known as Jesus Christ. If that is what Abraham saw. Does that not make Abraham a Christian? Oh, now you see something is happening here with this question. We are getting to some, somewhere important. What's the next thing Jesus says? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am, the Tetragrammaton, the divine name is something only God can have. By associating himself with this name, Christ is basically saying, I am God. <laughs> and, the, and the Jews understood what he was doing, what he was saying, because the next moment they took up stones to throw at him. And Jesus ran away because it was not the time for his passion yet. So he ran away from the Jews. It's not the time. It's time to leave. But we are getting to somewhere in here. We're getting to somewhere Uh now, I want to look at the epistles of St. Paul, his epistles to Galatians. There are numerous verses that I want to show you guys. The first one is Galatians 3, 7 to 9. St. Paul says, Therefore, know that only those, let me make sure, that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham and of the scripture, right? Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So, being a son of Abraham, is it by ethnic lineage? The Jews thought it was, but it's not so. It is about having the faith of Abraham. Is how you become a son of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith, St. Paul says the Old Testament foresaw that God will justify Gentiles by faith. Isaiah talks about this. Preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with believing Abraham. From the same section, Galatians 7.14, that the blessing of Abraham might com come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Moreover, Galatians uh, right, 26-29, to 29, 
For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So this is not a lame uh, race and gender doesn't exist in nonsense. It is something much bigger than that. Only people of carnal minds get that understanding from this part of scripture. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. <clears throat> so what he's basically saying is actually, in Christ, there is none of this ethnic superiority in faith. In faith, all ethnicities are the same. They're on the same order, you could say. There is not that one special ethnicity that is chosen. Listen to this, you supposed Zion, you Zionists who ca called yourselves Christian. Listen to this part. You shall read this verse. <laughs> You're the ones that shall read this verse. <clears throat> and Christ himself says the same thing in the parable of the wicked vine dressers. This is a very good parable. Uh, the message is very clear. He tells this to the Jews that he's talking to. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard, vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a vine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. Vine dressers, wine dressers, alcohol. I say, I'll say it as vine dressers. And the vine dressers took his servants beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Right? So the servants here represent the Jews, the wine dressers. This will be explained later on. Uh, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the wine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? The Jews said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to the other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. So what the Jews are basically telling Christ is that the people, uh, the servants, who were given the 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 vineyard vineyard uh, that mistreated the people that the owner sent, they will be destroyed. Now look at what happens here. Think of the servants as Jews, and think of the owner as God the Father, the Son as the Son, and the servants. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, the vine dressers are the Jews. Uh, right, the vine dressers are the Jews. The servants are the prophets, and they look at they looked at the prophets. They killed the prophets, and then God sends sends His Son. They killed the Son, and then what? The, and Christ asked them, "What would you do to the vine dressers?" In in a different way, what He's asking is that He's asking them, "What would you do to yourselves?" And the Jews say, oh, we will kill, we will kill us, right? And Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. What is that nation? The Gentiles, right? Now, I will not read Romans 9 to 11, but I will recommend reading Romans chapter 9 to chapters 11, uh, it's St. Paul talking about Israel's rejection of Christ and then why Israel Jews need the gospel, why they reject the gospel and that their rejection of the gospel is not told. So he, he has hope of the Jewish people. He's basically saying the Jews can be like me in the sense that they can come to the true faith and accept the God that they have rejected. Now, I'm going to move on a little bit to, uh, yeah, the, to the covenant, right? What is the relationship between the old covenant and the new covenant? And this is, an, this is inevitably a, a question 
that a lot of people have in their mind. What what kind of relationship do they have? Is it dual covenant? Is it is it like Marcionism? Does the, does the old covenant even exist? Are we freed from the old covenant? So St. Paul in his epistle to Hebrews says, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Then we have uh, Christ in the Sermon of the Mount, I believe, who says, I have not come to abolish the law, I have come to fulfill it. Right? He has come to fulfill it. Now what, what, do these, what do these passages mean? What do they mean exactly? Well, I want to start with the premise that the Old Covenant is based on the New. And the Old Covenant's purpose is to point us to the New Covenant. And so the fulfillment of the Old Covenant signifies the erection of the New Covenant. So that is the point of the Old Covenant in the first place. So one of the, one of the things that people wonder, well, you know, in Judaism you have animal sacrifices. But then you have in Christian, you don't have them anymore, Right? Why is that the case? Why is that the case? And a lot of people presuppose wrongly that, oh, we don't, Christians don't do animal sacrifice because, oh, you know, that's something, people, ancient people did that. But, you know, we, ca we came and we were like the smart people and we said animal sacrifice is bad. You should not do it. That's a bad thing. You should not do animal sacrifice. No, 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 no. That's not why we stop doing animal sacrifice. The animal sacrifice was fulfilled already in something higher. And it is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross as well. But it is also connected to the Eucharist. Right? It's, it's, so it's not because of some, some modernistic, more moralistic nonsense. But there's a purpose behind it. The greater sacrifice has already happened. You can sacrifice 20,000 rams and you will not even come close to the greatness of Christ's sacrifice to us, for us. Right? And Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. So this is also relates to the Eucharist. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Right? And by the way, uh, they also sing hymns, which means there's nothing bad with singing hymns. I've seen people say Orthodox are evil because they sing hymns. I've seen Protestants say that, which very bizarre because they, they sing hymns. So, but what I'm getting at here is that right, animal sacrifice, that's a type of something greater. It represents something that will happen in the future, something that is going to be great. And it has already happened. So there's no point in animal sacrifice. It has been fulfilled in the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the fulfillment of the animal sacrifices in the Old Covenant, which means numerous things. First of all, the Eucharist is something real. It's not, it's not a just mere symbolic. It's something real. Something you really do. And uh, again, it it's the fulfillment of the Old Covenant. So the Old Covenant is not something that we put in the trash can. The Old Covenant served its purpose. And that's what it ultimately is. It served its purpose. And, a lot of pe and, and another side of this kind of discussion is a lot of people, they're like, oh, you know, the Old Covenant, New Covenant, they contradict each other, right? They're like, you know, the Old Covenant told us we should, like, kill our enemies and we should persecute them, we should beat them up. And But then Christ came to the Sermon on the Mount, the hippie guy, and he said, oh, we should, oh, man, look, we should love our enemies and uh, don't listen to Old Covenant, we should love our enemies. A lot of people had this weird understanding. Now, there has been hints of the New Covenant even in the Old. So there is no contradiction. You want proof of this. Do you want proof of this? If you want proof of this, I will give it to you right now. Proverbs 25, 21 to 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head and the Lord will reward you. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. This is an example of loving your enemies. 
So the hints of this already existed in the Old Covenant. So the New Covenant really didn't bring anything new. The Old Covenant is just based on the New. There already is the New. The Old Covenant, the point of it is to point you to that direction. And it did point us to that direction. It served its purpose. That's why we don't have the Old Covenant. That's why St. Paul says, has the new covenant has made the first one obsolete. Didn't make it obsolete because of some other silly reason. And I think this is relevant to the discussion. Now, I want to get to this question and finalize it with this. Who are the real Jews? What is, what is this whole Jew thing about? In Galatians 6.16, St. Paul says, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. In this context, he's talking about the church. So he's calling the church the Israel of God. Now, here's what I want to finalize this with. Is, uh, is that when we're talking about Israel, right? And we say this in the liturgy, we call ourselves, we, we, we call the church Israel. And we then move on to Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9, where, where God says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, and I, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are, of, are a synagogue of Satan. Same thing is said in Revelation 3, 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. What is this whole business about people that call themselves Jews but are not? The fake Jews. Well, haven't we already talked about it a couple minutes ago? Like in Luke 3.8, how God can raise up children from Abraham. How in Galatians 3, St. Paul talks about that, that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham, the true Jews. So what, is, what does this mean? I want to say what it does not mean. This does not mean that Christians suddenly become, change their ethnicity into being Jews, right? We don't, be, we don't ethnically become Jews, but we share the same, same faith of Abraham, which was called Judaism. It was referred to as Judaism. It will not be incorrect to say that, that Abraham was a Christian because he saw Christ. Christ saw Abraham. They were the ones that conversed with Moses. Who did he talk to in Exodus 33? He talked with Christ, right? Face to face. So it will not be wrong to say that they are Christians. But what I'm getting at here is that the fake Jews in here are those who reject the true faith. So Judaism, the true Judaism, is about pursuing the true faith. If you're not pursuing the true faith, if you're not part of the true faith, then you are a fake Jew. Thus you become synagogue of Satan. And what I said, a lot of this might sound very worrying, especially for how we think about Jewish people. But I want to go back to Romans 11. And this whole chapter is St. Paul, who himself is a Jew, basically saying Jews will come back. They will repent. And St. John Chrysostom and St. Cyril basically, have, and many other church fathers basically say the same thing, is that that God loves the Jews so much that there is still that chance for all of them to come back to their old status, to be part of the chosen. But being chosen is not about ethnic lineage. It is about having the true faith. Remember, Abraham. Why is Abraham righteous? Is it because he's Jewish? No, it's because he had the true faith, and that's why he was, he was righteous. And I want to finalize this video, finish all of this, by... Showing you an image that I found, I kind of summarizes everything I talked about in here. And um, the misconception here is that Old Testament Judaism is more Judaism. They're the same thing. And in that line, there's this kind of schismatic line it's of the New Testament and Christianity, right? Whereas the truth is that Old Testament Judaism, New Testament, Christianity, same thing. They're part of the same team. They're part of the same thing. Whereas modern Talmudic Judaism is based on the rejection of the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. 
That is what it's based on. And so it will be completely wrong to say Christianity is a Jewish religion. Jewish religion, modern Jewish religion, is based on rejecting Christ. It's not based on anything else. It's based on rejecting their Messiah. True Judaism, ergo Christianity, is based on accepting the Messiah. It's based on accepting the true God. And that is what being a true Jew, if you want to say it that way, is all about. This is why the church is called the Israel of God. This is why the Gentiles are part of the spiritual Israel. And obviously this topic is kind of a difficult one. Uh, not too difficult, but somewhat. And it might confuse a lot of people. But hopefully I have done somewhat a, somewhat a good job at answering some of the questions that people have in their mind and, ex and expressed our position regarding this. Um, obviously, I, as an Orthodox Christian, believe that the true Israel of God is the Orthodox Church, and it is only the Orthodox Church, not any of the other churches, but only the Orthodox Church, the one that Christ established with in Matthew 16, 18 with Peter, which was based on Peter himself as a person, who is the first bishop, Peter's confession, of the true faith and in Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. These three principles that the church is based on is in the Orthodox Church. And so obviously, uh, if the Jews joined the Orthodox Church and the unbelieving Gentiles joined the Orthodox Church, all of them will be part of the chosen people. That's basically what I'm trying to say here. And so thank you all for watching this. Um, become Orthodox. End of <laughs> summarizing the entire video. Become Orthodox. Thank you all for watching this. I will, I will see you guys in the next video. God be with you all always.